Last lecture, we saw wavelet trees, and we saw how to do all the RSA-style queries on strings by representing the strings as a wavelet tree. We didn't really have time to talk about the time or space requirements of those queries, so let's talk about those here. And let's start by thinking about time. And to think about time, let's think of the shape of the wavelet tree. So here's one of the wavelet trees that we drew in the previous lecture. Uh, representing the string Mississippi. And this one's balanced, right? So like two children, two children, two children, all the leaves are at the same level of the tree. So let's just consider this, consider a balanced uh, wavelet tree and think about again what the queries are doing. The queries are essentially all taking a path either from the root to a leaf or from a leaf back up to the root in the case of the select query and they're doing some amount of stuff at each level of the tree as they go. So it's going to be important to characterize how many levels, you know, how deep the tree is. Because it's a balanced tree, we know what to say. It's about log base 2 of the number of leaves, which is the number of characters in the alphabet, or small sigma. Right? So we can say, okay, well, you know, sort of like plus or minus 1, we can say that the height of this tree is log base 2 of sigma, the alphabet size. Okay, so this would seem to be a multiplicative factor in whatever queries we're going to be doing. Now, but it's being multiplied by what? How much work are we doing at each level of the tree as we go up or as we go down? Well, let's just bring back those algorithms that we saw in the previous video and take a look at what's going on inside the loop. So here's the access query. So what's going on here inside the loop? This is just like a, an access, right? It's almost just like renaming something. We're just letting the bit vector in the parent node be called b. We're doing an access query now on that bit vector. Okay, so that's important. But we also know that an access query is constant time. Right? It's really just accessing a bit in a bit vector. Here's a descending into the child. That's just a little look up, you know, looking up the, the uh, the left or the right child. And then there's a rank query here, so that's important too. And we'll come back to this. I mean, obviously, we can use Jacobson's rank, right? So that might be a good reason to think that we can do this rank query efficiently. So really, kind of the important things are how efficiently can we do these two things in the inner loop, the access and the rank. And similarly, this was the access query. Let's now do the rank query. All right, so here's the, here's the rank query. Here's the inner loop for the rank query. Uh, what are we doing? That's just an access. That's looking up one of the bits in the code word for the query character, x. This is descending into a child, and this is doing a rank query. And then this is incrementing a counter. So where's the real sort of work here in this inner loop? Everything's pretty simple except possibly for this rank query. All right, so for the access, query we had an access and a rank. For the rank query we have a rank in the inner loop. And then for the select query what do we have in the inner loop? That's pretty simple. That's pretty simple. That's pretty simple. That's pretty simple. But then we have a select query right here. So it's going to hinge basically on how quickly we can do the rank access and select queries. But we know how quickly we can do them. We can do them all in constant time. right? That, that was the uh, when we're doing them on bit vectors, we know we can do them all in constant time. That's what we learned when we talked about Jacobson's rank and Clark's select. So let's fill in the table where we can put a worst case query time expression, big O expression, in, the, in this column. And think about them one at a time. And remember each time that we're going to assume a balanced wavelet tree so that the depth is about log base 2 of the size of the alphabet. So to figure out what time we need to put here, we need to think through, OK, well, what are we doing in that inner loop? We're doing rank and access. Right? Those are the two substantial things we were doing in the inner loop. Jacobson's rank is constant time, and so is access. So we can say that overall, we're doing log of sigma steps, but each step is constant time. So overall, we have log of sigma time, right? big O of log of sigma. OK, so that's how long it takes to do an access query. How about a rank query? Well, let's make our picture again. Let's again remember that the depth is log base 2 of sigma. 
And let's remember that in the inner loop of the rank query, the only complicated thing we're doing is a rank query on a bit vector. Right? But we can do that in constant time with Jacobson's rank. So we still have to do log sigma steps because we have to go from root to leaf. But each step is constant time, so we're going to get a big O log of sigma over there. Select, similar story. We're just going to do a select at each level of the tree. This time we're going from bottom up, but it doesn't really make a difference. We're still doing log sigma steps to go from the leaf, leaf back up to the root. I suppose we should also count that initial walk from the root to the leaf that we did in the select algorithm. So we go from root to leaf, then we go back up, and it's when we go back up that we're doing our select queries. Either way, it's still big O of log of sigma. Okay. So if we have a balanced wavelet tree, this is the answer to the question of how efficient can we make those queries. So when we went from bit vectors, where all these same queries could be done in constant time, and we shifted to strings, we could do them not quite in constant time, but in log of alphabet size time. OK. Let's think also a little bit about space here. And actually, we're going to come back and make a comment about another comment about time in a moment. But let's think about how we would represent these wavelet trees. Because we were sort of proud of ourselves for having pared down this data structure, right? We got rid of the strings, for example. Like, we're not actually storing the strings at each of the internal nodes. We're just storing the bit vectors corresponding to the remaining subsequence. And then at the leaves, we're just storing these characters, right? So ignoring the characters for a moment, how much are we paying to store the rest of the tree, to store essentially the structure of the tree together with the bit vectors that are labeling the internal nodes of the tree? Well, you might wonder, for example, do we need to store pointers, right? If we want to, in general, represent a tree or a graph, we might do that with with pointers, where the pointers are establishing the parent-child relationships or the you know, um, source-destination relationships. But in this case, we've got a very simple kind of tree because everything is a bit. You know, Everything in our internal node labels is a bit. And it's a binary tree, so every uh, internal node has two children. So we can imagine a different way of representing it where instead of having you know, nodes and pointers and things like that, we're just going to take these bit vectors labeling the internal nodes and concatenate them and concatenate them in a particular order which is level order. In other words, along the top level we'll write out the bits, then we'll go down to the next level and we'll write out the bits for the left child and we'll write out the bits for the right child. And we'll go down to the next level, and we'll have four, you know, potentially up to four things to do there. And we're just sort of doing it like that across each level, left to right. And that will be the order that we concatenate the bits. And then that representation, together with just like a tiny little bit of extra information, like for example how long the string is, will be enough for us to be able to navigate the shape of the tree. So let's think about that. So here's our concatenated set of bit strings. So this bit string here, this here, this here, OK? And so if we want to now use the tree in this representation, and we want to, let's say we're doing a rank query, for example. So we're going to start by doing a rank query against the root, which is this part. Well, we know n equals 11, right? So we sort of know that this part of the concatenated bit vector is the bit vector for that's labeling the root. I've drawn these spaces in here, you know, this space and this space, but just be be aware, there's not really a separator uh, being included here. It's just this is visual for our uh, visual ability to understand what's going on with this bit string. So I know that the first 11 bits of my representation are the bit vector labeling the node. But let's say I'm doing my rank query, and I've learned that I need to descend into the left child next, the left child of the root. Well, the good news is that the left child, it, it's predictable where it's going to be, right? Because of this level order, we know that the left child is going to come immediately after the root. So that's kind of an easy case. The more revealing case is let's think about what would happen if we had learned that we needed to descend into the right child. 
Well, then we know that the right child's bit vector is actually not going to necessarily be directly after the bit vector for the parent. Instead, we're going to have to jump over all the bits for the left child first, right? So how many bits do we have to jump over? In other words, how long is the, is the red underlined portion here, the, uh, the number of bits in the uh, label for the left child? Well, it actually can be determined by looking at these bits, right? Because actually every bit here corresponds to a zero bit here, right? So we can actually do a rank query on that first set of 11 bits in order to learn how long this red segment is. And likewise, we could do a rank query. Uh, so we're doing a rank sub zero in this case because those are the bits that correspond to the left child. And if we wanted to know how long this green segment is, well, we could do a rank sub one because that's how many bits are in the, in the right child. And so by augmenting our, by additionally doing these rank queries, we can get a sense at any given, wherever we are in the level order representation, as we are moving to, as we're descending through the tree, we're moving to the right in that level order representation. But in order to figure out how far to jump to the right, we are doing rank queries to the left, to the appropriate uh, part, to figure out basically how many bits do I have to skip over to get to exactly where I need to be in the next level. So that's the general idea. So that's why we can imagine if we're using a level order representation of a wavelet tree, then besides that representation itself, the, besides this concatenated bit vector, all we really need to know is something about the uh, characters, right? And maybe their codes. Okay? Now, one last point, which is gonna, uh, a point about space and then kind of also a point about time, is that what if we didn't have a balanced tree? What if instead we picked a Huffman-shaped tree and we did this you know on purpose with the hope that the Huffman coding is actually going to give us some kind of benefit. Well let's remember what our Huffman shaped uh, wavelet tree for the string Mississippi looked like. It looked like this right where it turned out because um, uh, I and S were the most frequent characters they both occur four times compared to M and P P only occurring two times, M only occurring once, that from the perspective of the prefix code, we want either I or S to split off first. We want either I or S to get the absolute smallest code, and then we want the other one to get the next smallest code, and then the longest codes can go to P and M. So it gives us this shape. And in some sense, this shape is more efficient, because you can imagine if we are going to query, let's say we're doing an access query into Mississippi, well, a fair number of those access queries are, going, are just, just based on the frequencies of the characters. Um, a fair number of those access queries could be, are going to be on I or S. And so the fact that I and S split off higher in the Huffman-shaped tree is a good thing. It means we can finish those queries more quickly. Right? We, don't, we don't have to descend as far through the tree to answer those queries. So, but presumably we're sort of... Uh, um, paying somehow. Let's just think about first how much space uh, does this representation take. In other words, we just said before that the way we're going to represent the wavelet tree is going to be, well, we want to store the code words for the alphabet characters. That's maybe not so big, so we're not so worried. But we, d we also want to concatenate all the bit vectors at all the internal nodes in maybe level order so that we now have a um, complete representation of all the bits and all the internal nodes. How many bits is that? It was a little bit, um, we didn't really count them up in the case of the balance tree, but let's count them up in the case of this Huffman shaped tree. Okay, so let's just start, I'm going to sort of gray this out a little bit. Let's just start by thinking about the very first M in Mississippi. How many bits is required total throughout the entire tree? How many bits are dedicated to that M, that first M? Well, the, here's one, right? So like, there's one right there. It's in the root, okay? If we were doing, say, an access query on that M, because we see a one in the bit vector, our job would be to descend into the right child. So we'd go this way. And now here's the M again in this subsequence. So 
that same m is being represented here and has a course and has a one bit again so uh, say we were doing an access query that would tell us to descend into the right child again and here's that m again right the m is at all three levels of the tree right so this m is contributing three bits to the total number of bits in all the bit vectors in the tree not surprising since the code word for m is 111 right if m's code is 111 that means you would go down three edges labeled one to get to the M, right? So, and that corresponds to the three bits that we just highlighted in this tree. So not a surprise. Likewise, we can do the same, we can ask the same question for the second character in Mississippi, the, the first I. And the first I, you know, it's right here, and there's a corresponding bit which is zero, which tells us to go, if we were doing, say, an access query, that would tell us to go down the left branch, and we're done. So that I only has one bit dedicated to it in the entire wavelet tree. Again, not surprising, since the code word for I is just zero. It's just one single bit. Likewise, let's look at the first S. The first S has two bits dedicated to it. Okay, corresponding to the fact that the code for S has two bits. Right? So you get the idea. Each character of the text has, in the whole tree, the total number of bits dedicated to that character is just the length of its code. So if we wanted to know how many bits there are total in a Huffman-shaped wavelet tree, we would take the Huffman code and we would, for every character in the string, we would just tally up how many bits are in the code for that character. Right? So the total length of all the bit vectors in the, wavelet, in the Huffman shaped wavelet tree equals the sum of the code lengths of the characters. And if you think about the, the, uh, the typical string, right, we are, when we are encoding it with a Huffman code, right, we have a guarantee about how many bits we're going to that are going to be needed to encode that string. It's basically at most, or it's at most, the zero order empirical entropy of the string plus one in parentheses times n, right? There's up to one bit of wastage per character, which is why we have to put that plus one in there. So this also tells us how many bits there are in the Huffman shaped wavelet tree, because it's really just saying uh, uh, n times the, the zero order empirical entropy plus one is the number of bits we would require to store the string using this, these codes, and those are exactly the bits that are here in this Huffman-shaped wavelet tree. You don't read them left to right, right? This is not the concatenation of the code words. You would have to go sort of like this, right? You have to read them sort of in this weird order, right? Because it depends on the shape of the tree. But they're all there, right? The bits in the Huffman-shaped wavelet tree are, are exactly the bits that would be in the concatenation of the code words of all the characters of the string. Which also says something about the time. Because after all, if we are now querying the Huffman-shaped wavelet tree, it's not a balanced tree, so we can no longer argue that it's worst case log of sigma time. That's just not true, right? Because the worst case might be that we get m, you know, that, that the queries are just a bunch of m's. And that's the worst case in terms of requiring us to go down three levels each time. But um, on average, let's say that we're querying using characters from the string, right? You know, randomly sampling characters from the string and doing queries. Well, then um, the average case query time is also basically something that we can express in terms of the zero order empirical entropy, right? So like if it's more likely that, I, that I'm going to query with S or I than it is that I'm going to query with M or P, uh, uh, matching the relative frequencies of these characters in the string, that means that a lot of the time I'm going to be able to stop after going down just one level or two levels, right? I and S being much more frequent than M and P, all right? So on average, the amount of work that I'm doing is also related to the idea of the zero-order empirical entropy.